This is Duke University. It's my very great pleasure to announce uh, this panel, Medical Memoirs and Social Agency in Planetary Perspective. Professor Achille Mbembe, born in Cameroon, obtained his PhD in history at the Sorbonne in Paris in 1989, and a DEA in political science at the Institut d'études politiques in Paris. He was an assistant professor of history at Columbia University in New York from 1988 through 1991, a senior research fellow uh, at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. from 1991 through 1992, Associate Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania from 1992 through 1996, Executive Director of the Council for Development of Social Science Research uh, in Africa in Dakar, Senegal from 1996 through 2000. Ashil was also a visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley in 2001 and a visiting professor at Yale University in 2003. He's written extensively on African history and politics, including Le Naissance du Maquis dans le Sud Cameroon uh, with Carthala in 1996. On the Post Colony was published in Paris in 2000 in French, and the English translation was published by the University of California Press, Berkeley, in 2001. In 2015, Wits University Press published a new African edition. He has an A1 rating from the National Research Foundation. Please welcome Ashil Mbembe. I'm actually going to introduce all the panelists first, and then we'll do the talks. Um, our second panelist, Nawazi Makmanazi, has a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge in 2005. She works on early childbearing to examine gender and generational relationships in, South Af in a South African urban township. She's a senior lecturer in anthropology at the University of Witwatersrand, and presently a senior researcher in the medical humanities program at the Witts Institute for Social and economic research. Her research interests revolve around youth, gender, and reproductive health issues. She is a co-editor with Divya Bana of Young Families, Gender, Sexuality, and Care, which came out in 2017. And finally, uh, please, please welcome uh, Noel Wasi. <laughs> Uh, and finally, our last panelist, Juan Obario, is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. He's the editor of the journal Critical Times, Interventions in Global Critical Theory, published by the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. He's the founding director of the Program on Global South Studies at the University of San Martin in Buenos Aires. He's an associate researcher at the Witts Institute for Social and Economic uh, Research in Johannesburg, as Deborah already mentioned, and has worked on programs built building uh, South-South academic collaborations uh, across regions and languages. His fields of expertise are critical theory and political anthropology, with a special focus on post-colonial studies and Southern theory. For his fieldwork research in South America and Southern Africa, he has received fellowships from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the American Council of Learned Societies. His essays have been published in English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Italian. He's the author of The Spirit of Laws in Mozambique, which came out with the University of Chicago Press in 2014, Coeur étranger, uh, with Berlin editions in 2014, A Matter of Time, The State of Things in Southern Africa, which is forthcoming. He is also the co-editor of Legados, Genealogos y Memorios Postcoloniales with Ediciones Godot in 2015, and African Futures, Essays in Crisis, Emergence, Possibility with the University of Chicago Press 2016. Please welcome Juan Obario and all of our panelists. First of all, I would like to thank Deborah for uh, inviting us here. I was joking yesterday with uh, some friends and I told them when Deborah calls, I just come running. Uh, and later on I asked, but why are you uh, calling me? But first of all, I have to just come. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, this book, you see this book uh, I'm holding on here, uh, is called uh, Mandela's Last Years. Uh, its author is uh, somebody called Vijay Ramlakan. Uh, Vijay was uh, the head of uh, uh, Mandela's medical team. Uh, the book itself was published 
uh, early this year by Penguin Books in, in South Africa. And soon after its publication, uh, a controversy ensued, which led to the book being uh, withdrawn from all the bookstores in South Africa. So you cannot buy it as I speak in South Africa. I was lucky enough uh, to be in a bookstore the day it appeared. And uh, that's why I have a copy. Uh, I wouldn't want to get rid of it. But if you offer a proper price, uh, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can negotiate. Um, the book was withdrawn uh, at the urging of Grace Marcel who uh, is the widow of Mandela, uh, Gracia had uh, threatened to sue the doctor whom uh, she believed had violated his uh, oath by uh, rendering public uh, a number of Mandela's medical details which should have remained confidential or in any case private. Uh, very interesting uh, legal issue therefore. So when Deborah invited us to contribute to this conference on, on breath, body, and voice, I thought it would be a good idea to revisit this book and reflect on the place of these uh, three terms in, in light of what we should call Mandela's health struggles. That to be, to be free from illness is in itself a struggle, a fight, uh, is not, is not given. Um, a fight of one's own body in the first instance, and a fight conducted by one's own will uh, before any uh, external intervention by, by a doctor. <clears throat> and as it happens, we know a lot about Mandela's political struggles. But for anyone who has read his own autobiography, it is called Long Walk to, to Freedom, and especially another book of his, which is not very well known, which is called Conversations with Myself. For anyone who has uh, read these two works, his political struggle for freedom went alongside with his personal struggles, uh, first of all, to remain fit and healthy, second, uh, to nurture his body through regular physical exercise, including in prison, in the cell uh, he occupied for, for 27 years, uh, early in the morning. And third, to cultivate his mind. And finally, to uh, pay the deserved attention uh, this needed to his, uh, let's call it his sartorial self. How, how, how to dress, how to appear in public, how to stand up uh, uh, in a dignified manner, and, and, and how to uh, 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 assemble uh, the others around that, that sartorial self. Um, so uh, freedom and health uh, from him were inseparable from a practice of the self which he perfected in prison. And uh, whose ultimate goal was the transfiguration of the body. Uh, in the sense that, as he puts it in conversations with myself, to be healthy and to be free became the two faces of the same coin. And you cannot be healthy if you are not free. You cannot be free if you are not healthy. Uh, and in fact, uh, for those who are interested in ideologies of uh, theories of liberation uh, in, in, in those parts of the world we come from, these uh, twin preoccupation with health and freedom uh, is something we haven't, uh, we haven't paid enough attention to. And reading Mandela uh, forces us to, uh, to do that. Um, and at the center of this coin with two faces, is the body, which according to Mandela we should care for, and at the same time we should aim, if not at transcending, at least at transfiguring, at turning the body into air. Um, that is, turning it into, into an idea. Uh, turning it into 
something that is structurally free, intangible, and, and perishable. So this question of that which does not perish because of its constitutive limits, uh, material constitutive limits, uh, is uh, an idea uh, that uh, traverses especially uh, uh, conversations with myself. And the contrast with uh, the medical uh, doctor's report uh, is, is all the more uh, dramatic uh, in this instance. So that's the first set of comments I wanted to share. Now there's a second set of comments uh, that have to do with the question of death. Because uh, in uh, the three books I'm working with, uh, uh, the doctor's book and the two books by Mandela, uh, hovering, first of all, uh, the, the three books are replete with uh, references to, to these three terms, to breath. And to put it rapidly, Mandela died of respiratory complications. Uh, it comes to that, that death to a certain point can be su summarized as the, uh, uh, that limit moment when we can no longer breathe, when we reach our last, last breath. Uh, however we want to define it, it comes somewhat to that. The inability or the end of our capacity to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, exchange with, with, with air. Uh, but hovering uh, over these three concepts, body, uh, breath, and voice, is a specter, the specter of, of death itself, uh, as that which annihilates the three. And in fact, death is something Mandela thought about a great deal. And I would now like to just make some comments on, uh, on this. Uh, first of all, it was a, a crisis event. Uh, he had witnessed, he had encountered it, and he had reflected upon, uh, upon during his lifetime. Uh, the first death he witnessed was that of his own father. Uh, he describes it in uh, his autobiography in a very dramatic manner. He had been sick, he was coughing, but he, he was addicted to tobacco, and uh, uh, he was in a very bad shape. Mandela was a little boy, uh, seven years old, I think, and uh, one day, one evening, he uh, asked to, to smoke his pipe. And after smoking his pipe, he collapsed and died. Uh, and Mandela was then forced to go and live with his, uh, 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 at the palace of uh, uh, the king of his uh, uh, ethnic community. But he also witnessed the death of his uh, first son. Uh, his mother died when he was in jail. He couldn't attend the funeral, uh, which uh, uh, an event on which he reflects a lot. Uh, so he, 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 he had seen it. But more importantly, he himself had faced the prospect of death during the Rivonia trial in, uh, in 1964, where, when a death sentence was a distinct possibility. And he talks about it, especially in conversations with myself and in other uh, uh, books. In his autobiography, he, uh, he says this. The night before the, the sentence was, was, was given, they met with lawyer and the comrades who were uh, on trial. And it was made clear to them that death, the death sentence was one of the possibilities the next morning. Uh, and uh, uh, Mandela says uh, they uh, uh, reflected on it. And uh, he recognized that he didn't want to die. But if he were to die, he wanted to, do, to go, uh, quote, in a cloud of glory. Uh, and he doesn't explain what, what does it mean to go in a cloud of, of glory. But we might uh, uh, suspect uh, uh, on the side, what, what that is all about. And then the next morning when he went to court, he, he said this to the court, and I quote, if I must die, let me declare for all to know that I will meet my fate like a man. I'll meet it like a man, uh, 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 which means that he was prepared to, uh, uh, let's see, face the consequences of his political engagements. And later when asked, 
uh, how he would like to be remembered uh, for after his death, this was his response. I would like it to be said that here lies a man who has done his duty on earth. And these were the inscriptions he wanted written on his tombstone. So this question of death as a consequence of uh, the duty one has, uh, 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 one owes to, to the earth, uh, we could call today the planet, is something, it seems to me, uh, that is intrinsically part of uh, uh, what Mandela means by, by voice, breath, and, and the rest. Now, uh, third uh, point, and I'll come now to, to the book and, and end my, my, my presentation. By all accounts, he lived a very long life, I think 93 years, years old. And during these uh, long years, he, he spent a lot of time in two institutions, uh, in prison, as you know, but also in the hospital. Uh, that, that <laughs> I don't know what is the, the relationship between the prison and the hospital, uh, whether, whether the prison is a kind of hospital or whether the hospital is a kind of prison. Uh, but in any case, uh, these are the two institutions in which Mandela spent most of his existence. And, uh, um, um, and uh, the, these two institutions, uh, um, in fact, his, his medical history portrays him as, as frequently ill uh, because of uh, several conditions that constantly warranted medical treatment. One key condition, there, there are many. I mean, he was sick all the time. He had to be taken out of Robben Island almost every month for something. Um, and, and, and then, uh, in his appearance, he was very strong man, very strong. I mean, uh, I had the chance to meet Mandela once. Yeah. Good, firm handshake. How are you? Uh, uh, very, very imposing. But this was a frail body uh, that had to be attended to uh, regularly. The key thing uh, was uh, um, the fragile state of his lungs. He wasn't born with weak lungs. It happened in the context of the forced labor he was subjected to during the years in, 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 in prison. So, so he, basically he died of respiratory uh, problems. He died twice. He died technically first on June the 8th, 2013. He stopped breathing after being turned on his uh, left side at about midnight. And according to his chief doctor, <laughs> Uh, he had to be, uh, he, he was then resuscitated. Uh, uh, he recovered, fought back. Uh, he had to be intubated, and a, a full interventionist med medicine had to be practiced. Um, key to this uh, uh, full interventionist medicine was uh, the performance of what is called a tracheostomy. Um, a tracheostomy, what it does is that it, uh, it removes the ability to talk. Um, for there to be speech, as, as we know, uh, air from the lungs must be directed across uh, the vocal cords uh, in the voice box uh, to cause the air vibrations that constitute speech. That, that speech is impossible without air, basically. Um, and um, uh, what happened is that Mandela's condition reached a point where this was the only measure uh, to try to improve the functioning of his respiratory uh, system. Uh, and uh, uh, on December 3rd, his health battles came to an end and he was no longer fighting back. And then started a moment of transition, uh, which I would like to interpret in African uh, traditional systems of thought, in African traditional systems of thought, you do not die just like that. Uh, you go through uh, what is called transitioning, um, uh, which is a moment when uh, supposedly the human being enters uh, the spirit world, 
uh, on his road to uh, the world of uh, the ancestors, which he or she has not yet reached. And, and in that spirit world, uh, he or she prepares then for the next existence with the, the, the ancestors. And in this period, his or her double uh, or soul is said to be uh, in two separate worlds and, and part of both. Um, so one is waiting to pass on to some other existence. So he entered that period and then uh, he died. Um, so uh, the question is how can we interpret all of this? Through what categories? I had last section on how this could be interpreted from within the paradigm of African pre-colonial systems of thought, but I think I have gone way beyond my, my time. Oh, I have one minute to... Four minutes, okay, okay. I will try telegraphically then to, just to put on the table uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the uh, paradigm, indigenous paradigms from within which uh, uh, this question of uh, voice, uh, breath, and body can be uh, let's see, interpreted. The, um, the, um, the first thing to, to say in these regards is the belief in most parts of Africa that all thoughts and, and feelings that have been expressed now, they have to be expressed, are structures made of air. The idea that, in fact, <laughs> materiality, air is the foundation of any materiality and expressivity. That without air, forget about materialism <laughs> or the body. You have something out there, uh, but the proper matter is constituted as a result of some manifestation or the other of, of the air and the energy it, it brings with, with, with it. That is the reason why a body is always a double. Everybody has a double. Everybody, uh, not I mean, all of us, of course, but every single body uh, only makes sense in relation to uh, mm, a double that is in relation with uh, this. It's not a matter of what is original and what is a copy. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. The two are co-constitutive, the principle of co-constitution. Um, then uh, a human being, let's see, no, I'll leave that behind. We'll take me too far and there's no time. Um, so what is voice then? Voice in this context is, is uh, uh, also itself inhabited by, by a double. Uh, nothing that is without a double utters voice. Only that which has a double is capable of voice, of voicing. Um, so the belief is that voice has meaning it is a meaning that must be deciphered. It comes from the inside of the body as a mixture of exhaled breath. And this exhaled breath expresses the deep singularity and originality of the person who is releasing it. Uh, so that's the first uh, thing I think we, 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 one would like to think about. The second, now really end there, uh, is that in these pre-colonial systems of thought, the breath is, in fact, an enigmatic extension of, of, of the cell. So if you see, this means that the breath challenges notions of what a body means and what it means to be fully embodied. Uh, body is, of course, that which is tangible and fleshly, but it is also that which dramatically indicates the possibility of subjective expansion outside that which is tangible and fleshly. So when Mandela uh, breathes his last breath, in the kind of paradigm I have spoken about telegraphically, it doesn't mean really the end. 
it means simply the release of life and the disposal of those who are still alive and at the disposal of what he calls in one of the sections of his conversation with myself, the earth at large, which we could call today uh, the planet. So the politics of health the poli is inseparable in this case of the politics of freedom itself interpreted as the politics of life, but the life of the humans, of the ancestors, and of the earth at large. And it seems to me that is what is uh, really powerful uh, in att uh, attempting to uh, read Mandela in light of these three uh, concepts. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do in today's talk is actually talk about the voice specifically. Um, I'm interested in, in stories people tell and in how they choose to tell those stories. And in particular, I'm interested in stories that they tell about who they are and the lives that they live. So for my talk, I'll be discussing two medical memoirs, which were written by two South African physicians um, at different parts of South Africa, at different eras in South Africa's history. The first memoir was written by a doctor called William Pick. And William Pick was one of the first cohort of so-called colored doctors who um, was admitted to study at the medical school at the University of Cape Town. At this time, which was in 1959, the medical school in Cape Town did not admit black African students. It was only the University of Natal that actually black African doctors um, could be trained. The memoir that William Pick wrote was called The Slave, Shall, sorry, the Slave Has Overcome, and it was published in 2007, four years after Pick himself retired. The second memoir that I want to talk about is by a medical doctor called Maria Padime. She was also trained at UCT, and she began her medical studies in 1994, and this was the year of South Africa's uh, transition into democracy. Maria herself practiced for four years before she hung up her stethoscope, and the title of her memoir is Postmortem, The Doctor Who Walked Away. So, Besides these actually being a handful of memoirs that South African physicians have written, these two books are important in providing some insight into three, three things. The first is the actual intellectual and emotional process of training and practicing as a physician. The second is the complexity of doctoring and healing, particularly with respect to the individual and the community, and the personal and political. And the third is the importance of, of, of the ethical in actually achieving a humanized professional identity. So, of course, these issues aren't actually particular only to physicians in South Africa. They are also a challenge to physicians in other parts of the world. However, the claim that I make is that there's something different about education and practice of physicians in South Africa in the past and today. And part of this difference really lies in the ways in which the policy of racial segregation, also known as apartheid, shaped and continues to shape medical education and medical practice. And part of this also has to do with the disease burden that the country faces which in itself is a legacy of apartheid in terms of its racial and structural inequality, which pervaded and continues to pervade South Africa. So both these memoirs in the way, in their own way, actually make this point. <coughs> so what can we learn from these medical memoirs from written by these physicians who were actually inside the system? What Pick says is that for him, studying medicine was something that forcibly inscribed race onto his body. As a student of color, certain opportunities were foreclosed to him. For example, no student residences would accommodate him. And even though he was an excellent cricket and rugby player, he was not allowed to represent the university in sport. He writes, and I quote, 
This was a great disappointment, and from the first day, it was clear that we, students of color, were not fully fledged members of the university community. The sense of alienation was to become worse over the next few years as the effect of the university apartheid began to bite." End quote. In the memoir, Pig describes at length how the segregation of races was actually maintained through the medical education that he got. And that this was, one, this was what contributed to the failure and to the dropout of many people of color. So, so let me give you an example. Um, during apartheid, students of color were not allowed to attend to white patients. They were even forbidden from conducting post-mortems on white bodies. White students, in contrast, could actually attend to people of all races. This exclusion firstly resulted in white students and colored students having qualitatively and quantitatively, quantitatively different knowledge despite actually taking the same course. Secondly, the exclusion was also a way that they were repeatedly humiliated, that is, students of color. And it was a way to remind them that they were second-class citizens. During post-mortems on white bodies, students, were, students of color were actually told to leave the room, and they were made to sit behind a curtain. This hum humiliation was so acute that Pick actually writes that they developed a strategy where they would ask the nurse beforehand what race the body was, and they would choose to deliberately not attend if it was a white body. The lack of geographical access to the university outside of lectures also posed a further <coughs> challenge to students of color. And given the geographical distances that they had to travel because of the Group Areas Act, which dictated who could live where, the journey to medical campus for some of these students uh, started as early as 3 o'clock in the morning and often ended well after midnight. So after six years of these exclusions and humiliation, Pick was one was the only one of a dozen or so colored students who actually finished the course. <coughs> And after his graduation in 1964, he took up an internship at Baraguanath Hospital in Johannesburg. And for the first time, he got to work alongside black African doctors and nurses. And it was while he was practicing in Johannesburg that Pick continued to witness racism within the medical profession. He regularly observed the way in which poor black bodies were used as teaching material by white doctors. And he also observed, and I quote, the existence of a microculture that, that diminishes the dignity of human beings, end quote. Pick describes such experiences as being very important in conscientizing him in the need to fight against apartheid and to be relentless. And although this memoir was written about a decade after South Africa had transitioned to, to democracy, Writing the memoir for Pick actually provided him a platform to expose and, in a sense, to chastise his white peers and his white physician lecturers, who at the time had the power to ignore these apartheid policies in their classrooms. But instead, many of them decided not to act or to actively uphold these racist policies. At this time, it's also important to note that UCT was actively opposed to apartheid policies, or at least they said they were. So the memoir provides Pick with a way to both voice what he experienced as a person of color in the medical system, as well as what he did in order to resist apartheid. In the postscript to the chapter on medical education, Pick asks the question, and I quote, why dwell on the difficulties, the trials, and the tribulations of a medical student of color at the University of Cape Town more than 40 years ago? He writes that for him it was important, firstly, to put on record some of the harsh realities of being a medical student of color that he had to undergo under apartheid. Second, for him, it was important to show the complicity of white professors, lecturers, university administrators, doctors, nurses, and students in the abuse of fellow South Africans. 
And thirdly, he says it is important for him to call these people to account for their action. And he writes, I quote, it is my view that unless and until those who were complicit confront and acknowledge their complicity, we cannot move forward as a society. Before I move to discuss Padima's experience of medical education, let me just give a big brief background to um, the larger context in which both the doctors were trained in order to make clear what needed to be done during the transition from apartheid to post-apartheid South Africa, um, in a sense, a move towards equality and social justice. During apartheid, which is when PIC was educated, South Africa had a two-tier healthcare system. White people had access to services equal to those in the developed world and had higher levels of lifestyle diseases, whereas black people had access to basic health services and they suffered more from infectious and transmittable diseases and from diseases of poverty. Each racial group had its own health department during apartheid and the South African government controlled these health departments and, they, and it also determined the budgets of the health departments. So the resources were actually allocated unequally and based on race. And it is not surprising that the black health departments actually were severely underfunded. They were under-resourced and understaffed. So just by way of example, um, in 1990, the ratio of doctors to patients in rural areas uh, where the black, majority of black people lived was 1 to 41,000, whereas in the white urban areas, it was 1 to 900. In terms of budgets, the entire health budget of the black homeland of KwaZulu-Natal, which had a population of 5 million, was the same as the entire budget of one whites-only hospital in Johannesburg. So the health system that the ANC inherited in 1994, which is the context in which um, Maria Padimo began her medical education and training, was one that was centralized, it was undemocratic, and it was highly fragmented. And since its intention was to serve the needs of the white population, the health system itself was biased towards curative and high level services. It was not geared to meet the needs of the majority. So in addition to these challenges, um, the ANC was also confronted and actually inherited a country that was incubating an epidemic. From less than 1% in 1990, the HIV prevalence grew to 27% in the antenatal population by 2002. So one of the big challenges of the ANC government was to make health services available, affordable, and accessible to all. And to do this, the health plan was to, introduce, was to adopt the primary health care approach. And so what the government did was it integrated the previously racially divided health services. It established a district-based health system. It ensured that rural and poor areas had sufficiently and adequately skilled health workers. And it tried to address the racial and gendered diversity within the health system. So um, Palima, like Pick, in her memoir, actually writes about the experiences of medical education and of practicing medicine. And she describes the overwhelming workload, the confusion, the continual sense of inadequacy and uncertainty, and the humiliation that junior doctors suffered in the hands of specialists and registrars. Hers is not actually a description about a racialized experience but it's rather about the brutality of the pedagogical approach and the inadequacy of the content of, medic of medical education, in which, uh, which was preparing junior doctors for services in community hospitals. For many of the newly trained doctors, um, the majority of the hospitals that they practice in were under-resourced, they were overstretched, they were understaffed, and they were oversubscribed. There were also shortages in medication, 
in equipment and in qualified staff. staff. So in practice, that meant, this meant that many of the junior doctors actually were put in charge of patients without any supervision. They also worked very long hours, often 12-hour shifts, shifts on, 12 consecutive, sorry, on four consecutive days. And if these shifts fell over the weekend, they were inevitably encountered things like gunshot shots, stabbings, car accidents, rapes, and beatings. Often the hospitals where they work were actually in dangerous neighborhoods. And Paloma herself describes a particular toll that these kinds of working conditions took on her. She writes about how when she left the hospital after dark, she would deliberately break the speed limit in order to get arrested, and she, which she never did. But she planned that during the court appearance, she would refuse to pay the fine, arguing that the particular conditions that she worked under necessitated the reckless driving because they were so dangerous. For some of her peers, the sheer exhaustion, the sheer exhaustion that they experienced actually resulted in needle stick injuries with infected patients, or they actually, many of them acquired TB because they themselves were run down. The message of Palima's book is that practicing as a doctor in the public health system in post-apartheid South Africa is overwhelming. And that the particular med education that medical students are given does not prepare them for the onslaught. And it actually may cause them more harm than good. She writes, and I quote, it irks me that, the, that practicing medicine in South Africa's public hospitals is such a harrowing experience for many, that doctors work inhumane hours in appalling conditions and face numerous hazardous, asso numerous hazards associated with work. It cannot continue that working as a doctor in the public health system is in itself an occupational hazard." End quote. These sentiments have resonated with many young doctors who are deciding after finishing medical school not to practice. And they're beginning to talk about it, to write about it, and to expose what they see as a brutal form of education and working in inhumane conditions. So 15 years ago, after his retirement, William Pick noted that, and I quote, the struggle for a just and morally defensible system of medical education in South Africa did not end in 1994. And for Maria and a new generation of physicians, this struggle continues. Thank you. These are fragments from a memoir. <clears throat> the person I was passed away in early 2008. At that time, I was diagnosed with a type of illness that has a statistical rate of survival of 40%. I underwent medical treatment and a transplant at the end of that year, and I have been in remission since then. For the last few years, I have been reflecting on the meaning of a life lived in remission, its sense of overwhelming loss, and also its gains. Is this an afterlife of sorts? What is this temporality lived between life and death in the light of the fact that medical science does not define a cure, but instead makes reference to remission? How can this type of liminal form of life be conceptualized as an open-ended, uncertain afterlife? The state of emergency is here, of course, an obvious reference. Expert and popular discourse referring to the return of the body to a healthy state after a period in which the norm is suspended and the pathological has prevailed. In relation to this, how do political metaphors of war and occupation play a key role in our romantic understanding of the subjects of illness, of patients, as well as technologies of cure, from individual medical treatment to humanitarian interventions, which often combine military maneuvers and technologies of health? Military metaphors reverberate along a chain of signification 
that connects illness and medical treatment to questions of war, attacks, struggle, survival, antibodies, and defenses. Immunity has moved from its initial context in law and diplomacy to the realm of biology understood as war. Why is the cure of a life-threatening illness considered as survival? The language of catastrophe does not seem to encompass the actuality of bodies interacting with their milieu, of bodies internally dying all the time, within a continuum of life that is not linear, not a matter of death or survival, but rather of oscillations and interactions. So no, not immunity, but community. The language of war and occupation reinforces the individualistic sense of immunity as an isolated organism heroically fighting a long struggle for survival. These metaphors that link health to models of security preclude a view of the body in constant interaction with other intersecting bodies. A remission, which might be considered perhaps a cure after several years, is a collective process and not an individual struggle or lone survival. Metaphors. The language of survival as a supposed fight against illness that not, does not make much sense in the context, for instance, of an autoimmune disease, where subjectivity appears split in the situation of the body attacking itself. Metaphors of war do not make much more sense here in a context where recovery of health cannot be considered some kind of transitional justice after a civil war waged within the body. But what is the relation between social history and an individual medical history? Wherein lie the poetics and the politics of illness and healing? I was born in Buenos Aires in 1969. I spent my childhood in the context of military enforced terror implemented by a seven year long dictatorship, 1976 to 83. Blurred child memories of joy and happiness appear now in whirlwind of color, distorted faces, endless echoes of laughter a certain atmosphere of intimate oppression, of surveillance, of something not moving along, of something not being quite right. Secrecy unfolding, uncovering the elaborate yet clumsy ways in which reality was effaced from the children's curious eyes. My immediate family was in no way affected by the violence and horror of their regime. I was privileged, and yet, Years later, I would come to recognize those childhood years as the birthplace of an accentuated sensation of dread, a feeling of asphyxia that emerged from unknown sources. With the excuse of the concrete threat of violent subversion, the military regime implemented a widespread system of general political and cultural repression. As seen a sad reiteration of the Bertolt Brecht poem, soon after the coup d'etat, the armed forces had annihilated the oppositional guerrillas. Then during the next few years, they incarcerated, kidnapped, and killed thousands of activists, workers, artists, students, almost anyone who could be suspect of holding any progressive views on society. And then, as they had promised, they killed or repressed the neutral bystanders. As a kid, I grew up among the most paradoxical environment of knowledge and occlusion. Most of all, it was a mixed context of terror and love. The affected world of a kid, the world of an equipment of care, as perceived by the eyes of a child, was blurred by the feeling of imminent threat, by all the things that went unsaid, the words that could not be uttered, in the darkened light of fear and loss of vanishing and disappearances. After my medical treatment, I started returning to Buenos Aires, where I had not been for a few years, uh, walking in the streets of my neighborhood. Um, one of those first few days after returning, something became very striking to me. I, I was walking, looking 
uh, down to the floor. Uh, a, a very unexpected thing. I encountered a plaque on the cobblestones of the streets. And what had happened was that after many years in which an amnesty law had, passed, had been passed and the military commanders and the perpetrators of atrocities had been released, uh, there was a return to a sort of justice and a reopening of trials, a reopening of collective memory. And this included uh, that certain groups had been um, placing plaques in memory of the disappeared throughout the city at the exact uh, place where someone had been kidnapped by the paramilitaries. So now all over Buenos Aires you see these colorful plaques with the name, the date, maybe the occupation and the exact date of the, of the disappearance. <clears throat> Health also unfolds in between life and death as a transitional space. As in the memories triggered by these localized memorials for the disappeared, the living dead, the never found, never returned, never buried, never mourned prisoners, plaques and monuments located now throughout Buenos Aires, for instance also in the site of former detention clandestine camps. The state of emergency of my medical treatment triggered memories of which I had been unaware. Memories of growing up in a protected environment, yet located within the dreadful context of totalitarianism. Memories also of the political spring, the dream of democratic transition in the immediate post-dictatorship moment that went alongside the uncovering of the horror of counterinsurgency, of the absent dead, bodies of the disappeared, of the impossible mourning of those remains. And now, these days, I remember all this terrible, yet so quotidian, so straightforward. So much has passed in so little time. But what do I intend to convey through the metaphor that I use, saying that now I am a new being in a new organism, that I have somehow actually become a different person? In an essay on the concept of health, Georges Canguillem quotes, among other references, a striking sentence by René Lerich that says, health is life lived in the silence of the organs. After my experience, I perceive today that health unfolds in between life and death as a transitional space. Health takes place between silence and deafening sound between stillness and white noise. Health is life lived in the silence of the organs. This statement has a very particular echo for me, besides its evocative tone and manifold senses. During my childhood, the totalitarian regime had developed a discourse of mute signs and oblique words that soon infected the collective quotidian public language. I have always thought that a certain language of double meanings, of dark humor and unveiled senses that is pervasive today in, our, in the Argentinian public sphere, uh, stems to a large extent from the censorship and deathly repression implemented by the military regime. When I was eight years old, a peculiar sign was placed all over Buenos Aires. I remember it being located in particular downtown, on the rotunda around the main symbol of the city, a white obelisk. Uh, the sign carried the shape of a car horn on a white background crossed by a red oblique line and the caption read, silence is health. The sign, of course, referred to the prohibition of blowing horns and the need for lowering urban noise levels as a question of public health. It was a not so veiled statement about censorship and the threat against voicing dissent in the public sphere. The military are not very subtle. Um, <laughs> intellectuals. Health is, live, is life lived in the silence of the organs, quoted Canguilliam. The regime's propaganda linking life and death posited health as unfolding alongside a very narrow path, 
as a pantomime, as a quiet pantomime. To stay alive in the state of exception, one must be quiet. Health is silent. Silence means uh, health. Then in my childhood, of course, there was also that old song by Paul Simon, which I learned as a kid in Buenos Aires. Some lyrics about sounds of some kind of silence that grows like cancer. Terror operates in that way as the metastasis of silence, disseminating uncertainty and the cold fear that paralyzes the senses as the internal enemy gathered in cells of terror is killed in the so-called dirty wars of counterinsurgency. Silence must spread throughout society, which then becomes a desert of science. A whole society silence, a large assemblage of individuals, each one of them inserted in a small compartment increasingly isolated by waves of incommunication. The military dictatorship established the real as that, quote, army of metaphors and metonymies that Nietzsche said was the definition of truth. Army of metaphors and metonymies. The medical military regime of counterinsurgency the totalitarian system of defenses and immunity against the propagation of the political cancer posited the questions of the control of the body through violence and through language. The dictatorial regime itself had deployed the metaphoric language of illness and health. The regime bombarded the psyche of the population with an artillery of metaphors related to illness, an imagery of the cancer represented by the subversion of leftist guerrillas linked to alleged international conspiracies. Is scientific discourse metaphoric, or is it revealing a truth of the body, positing the question also of the subject itself as metaphor? Is the subject a detour around itself? Of course, Susan Sontag develops a reflection on these questions, but following her arguments, we can ask, what is illness if it can be conceptualized as metaphor, as a fictive detour of the body? What does illness translate or transfer as that deferral of, of the body? Can Guillaume, the recognition of health as truth of the body in an ontological sense, must admit the presence of truth in a logical sense. Health allows the body to speak more honestly and more purely. If illness is a constant white noise in the background of life, how does scientific metaphoric discourse work towards a cure between truth and metaphor? Another memory. In 1978, when I was nine years old, Argentina hosted the Football Soccer World Cup. In a country where this sport occupies a central place within popular culture, the military dictatorship organized the event as a large propaganda campaign directed both towards both national and foreign publics. It was aimed at showing the international community and media a country pacified by the totalitarian regime after the political crisis of the early 70s. The regime utilized the sports event in order to launch a large nationalist campaign touching upon all kinds of popular emotions and affects boosting chauvinism identity, trying to unify a majority of the population around countering what the dictatorship had labeled an international anti-Argentine communist campaign. Argentina won that World Cup in 1978. The scenes of jubilation and mad happy celebration with multitudes, with flags, horns, endless confetti were reiterated in every large city and small town across the country. I was one of thousands of happy moved children celebrating that victory after each game. We would join and blend in with the small crowds that were jumping, chanting, laughing, screaming, getting out of their chest who knows what anxiety or pain or joy, but celebrating the win over a foreign uh, team. Among all the military-like marches and anthems that the regime broadcasted constantly as soundtrack of that month of passion and pride. But I remember all this 
as, as many others in my generation, with trepidation and sorrow and with a distant, never dormant fear because the Football World Cup that Argentina hosted and won took place at the height of the counterinsurgency operations of disappearances, executions and torture that ravaged the country in the second half of the 70s. The city was then crowded with clandestine subterranean centers of detention and torture, the largest one, the main one. The headquarters of the repression was located very close to the stadium in which the final game of the cup was held not far at all from the 50,000 voices that cheered and celebrated with every goal that sealed that victory. Health, illness, memory, another critical event of violence through which I lived many years later also triggered those memories uh, from my childhood. I was living in New York on 9-11, on 2001, and I will bracket for now an analysis of that event and the political reactions of that event. But in the context of this, I can recount that um, the immediate scenes that happened after 9-11, uh, the subsequent weeks, triggered all those also uh, very old memories that I had not been aware of. Memories of the dictatorship, certainly, but also memories of the Malvinas Falklands War, 1982, the military planes uh, and, the, and the, the lights going off throughout the city, the images, the photographs of disappeared people that you could see after 9-11 on a place on bus stops all over Manhattan of people looking for the disappeared appeared. Um, certainly the atmosphere of dread and chauvinist nationalism that ensued the 9-11 events. Was that event, that attack by secret foreign cells and the political reaction to it, as well as the expansion of security and surveillance, an autoimmune attack on democracy? Are we living in the aftermath of this autoimmune illness of the social? Is democracy perhaps the political equivalent of living in remission? The first casualty of war is truth. The first casualty of truth is war. I learned this during my childhood and my memory kept it guarded in some unconscious realm until this knowledge was reactivated during my medical treatment within that space of war, defenses and counterinsurgency of truth and falseness. In order to heal, is it better to know the truth, quote unquote, is it better to remember or to forget? Uh, I begin to conclude here. Is cancer an illness of memory then? No one knows the true causes. Myriad scientific hypotheses are constantly tested and discarded. Billions of dollars are spent in the war on cancer, seeming as ineffective and futile as invasions of Middle Eastern republics or raids into African secret compounds where the cells keep splitting and proliferating. Cells can be seen as storages of memory as reservoirs carrying information relating to the past. Cells are memory traces, traces, repetitions of a singular event. When I was diagnosed and they started conducting all kinds of tests on me, they constantly asked me about my medical history, previous illnesses, ailments, malign effects. Then I was immediately questioned about the past, my background, my family, histories of illness. Cancer is considered an illness of memory related to kinship and inheritance. Genealogies are drawn, family trees intersect clinical records, cancer can be inherited perhaps, and even if from one generation to the next the disease might not emerge, it could surely reappear later, linking generations of descendants, a small family affair. The cells as traces left by no one, traces as non-originary beginning, a synthesis of past and future. Cells are always transforming themselves, moving, disseminating the cell as future trace of a past that had never occurred. Cancer cells disseminate change location, mime other cells, transform their identity and occlude it 
and go undetected, as in the 70s or in, during 9-11? What elements in mind, in biography, in body, in our corporeal matter might anticipate the illness as narrative or the illness as metaphor? If cancer is an illness of memory and genealogy, it also shows impossible voids and blind spots. Cancer is absolute unemployed negativity that refuses to work. And how can the organism be hospitable and transform the illness, make it work as part of a community instead of fighting it under the military metaphor of war and defenses? Cancer reveals that the illness is time itself, devouring the body from within, consuming life from the inside. Time splits the body in two. Nothing ever can occur at the very same time. There's always a delay of perception, of communication. The split body produces time, gives time, yet it is also constantly consumed by it. Cancer is an illness of memory an ailment of time. We can envision the memory of the body as a collective memory and those cells as traces. And yet, whose memory is this? Thank you. I wonder if there's something in the way you see health and freedom implicated through Nelson Mandela that gives us uh, something, an alternative to biopolitics. Because it seems here that instead of discipline, in a way he gives us the power, we have something like, I think of the monastic, Benedictine monastic practices of disciplina, and something in which the a cultivation of the self, so a freedom achieved through the cultivation of the self, as opposed to Foucault's power. And that seems quite interesting given Nelson Mandela you know, being in prison and finding a certain kind of <coughs> from these prison walls through health. And then I wonder with, with Juan, this wonderful narrative you give then if that freedom might be a return or must be a return if it, if it is a possibility of, of finding one's wound or tracing one's scars that, that is achieved through the attempt to, to seek help for the, the, the possibility of the mission so i just wonder about um, if this is a possibility of seeing a kind of ambivalent freedom that is that is not fallen to uh for course by politics thank you i grew up in south africa after the white person and whatever phrases we kept hearing was we can forget but not forget. And that was the Afrikaner population referring to the British rule of them in concentration camps. It's a theme which has constantly puzzled me and I sit here wondering to what extent forgiveness is a letting go and a, and a breathing out um, and how we should pass that together with the painfulness of memory. And I say that also in the context of looking at Mandela and his so to speak, in a sense, forgiveness towards what apartheid had done to him and being criticized subsequently for it. The ensuing Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which is, people have an ambivalent response to. We hear about Argentina, the generals being let out eventually. I'm sitting next to Lillian now, where we're going through the Colombian mm -hmm. ordeal of, uh, uh, so to speak, forgiving the plot. But I'm trying to. Has a phrase which has been around for a long time, forgive but not forget. And I'm trying to couple that with the breath as well, because in a sense, forgiveness is a letting go of the breath. So I'm wondering how to couple the painfulness of memory and memoir with that kind of thing. I think we had one additional question in the back there. Please, Dada. I had two other points to that. Um, that. That according to uh, Warwick Anderson and Ian Mackey and their book Intolerant Bodies, the whole discourse of uh, intolerance of self, uh, autoimmunity, really emerged in the 1940s. So I think that one's connection um, of, of illness experiences to the unfolding of history was just so meaningful. And in relation to the question of air, um, 
in Western traditions too, we, we have that same uh, emphasis, which has been subsumed in the notion of mind and cognition. When you look at the idea of inspiration or souffre mm -hmm. in the French tradition and in other traditions, that breath uh, is connected to spirit, and spirit is very, it's very porous, mm -hmm. it's very uh, breath-like in its metabolism, and has been replaced with this notion of a kind of truth, mind, brain, object. So I just wanted to, to throw out in, in relation to um, the question of biopower, um, disciplinary power, what what we we have uh, in 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 the case of of Mandela uh, uh, and and the prison, and to be even more specific of the cell the cell inside the prison is uh, what we have here is is a model in which uh, of course uh, a meta power is is exercised i mean he of course he can move but his movements are not only uh, surveilled but they are a whole set of restrictions imposed on the capacity of his body to, to move around. And at what time, under what conditions, um, there is a disciplinary regime uh, which segments uh, the time, uh, the broad, broader time of imprisonment, uh, and also the, uh, the time of the day, I mean, from the moment when you wake up and the sets of activities you are supposed to perform uh, to the moment when you can walk in the, uh, the little square to breathe, uh, supposedly, uh, to when you can eat, and at what time you're supposed to, to go to, to bed and, and study, and the lights are, are turned off. So, so uh, that regimentary uh, discipline is, uh, is, is there. But what is really interesting is the question which Mandela keeps asking in his two books. How is it that I can be free in, although my body is somewhat in chains? The possibility that one can still be free in spite of the objective material conditions of incarceration in which one finds one, one, oneself. And, and in this case, he believes that one can be free through self-discipline. Self that, that one can discipline one's own body. That in fact, we can't be free if we cannot discipline our own body. <laughs> Disciplining here meaning taking care of it. So for instance, he wakes up in the morning and he dutifully does, he practices his physical exercise every single day, except when he is he's ill. Um, so self-care, self-correction, um, but even more importantly, the uh, learning of, as you put it, a capacity to let go. That in fact, <laughs> the whole business of, of, of being a, proper, a full human being is to take care of one's body, but at the same time to let it go to be able to let it go, to uh, use the term breathe it out, in a process of, I call it transfiguration, but because I don't find any other term. Now, that requires almost monastic asceticism, uh, uh, which you also find in, if you read the works of, uh, autobiography of, the biography of Sisulu, uh, Walter Sisulu, uh, even even Gandhi, all of those people who at one point had to fight heavy regimes of oppression. Uh, the fight against these heavy regimes of oppression always started uh, uh, with these uh, 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 experiments with one's body uh, in an attempt at, uh, at, at releasing it, at, at being free uh, from it. 
And forg forgiveness, it seems to me, is basically the outcome of that, that kind of political theology, because that, that's what it was. I mean, they believed in something uh, on the, in the name of which they were willing to sacrifice their own life. Uh, uh, and and we, what we have to deal with here is, is a political theology. As far as the body double is concerned, it's, it's really, I mean, in African traditional systems of thought, it's not a matter of split. Um, splitting is a, is a purely Cartesian category, really. Um, it's, it's founded on the, um, the, the many dichotomies without which, and now I'm really being polemical, Western thought is unthinkable. I mean, it's all, it needs two things, uh, body and mind. Uh, you can go on and on and on. It's uh, interminable. Uh, the dichotomies uh, without which Western thought cannot stand up. That's not at all the case in African uh, traditional systems of thought, where the principle of multiplicity is, that's what you have. Uh, multiplicity re, uh, requiring, in turn, rel relationality, relations. It's a metaphysics of relations rather than a metaphysics of essence. The question is not a question of being. The question is one of relations. Or if you want you, I know who you are. Through the sets of relations, you are able to uh, uh, weave which constitutes who you are. There's no you outside of that web of relations. So relationality and multiplicity, rather than being ontology, if you want. Uh, that's the difference. And in this paradigm of relationality and multiplicity, split is, I mean, is the, it's a terrible drama. Uh, when you reach a split, then we know that you have failed. Uh, everything is the labor of life and the labor of health, acquiring health, psychic health, and bodily health, is the result of your capacity to compose with all the elements of the existent. Humans, animals, plants, air, water, and so fire, and so forth and so on. So it's an entirely different epistemology. And, and in that sense, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, it also paves the way for a different kind of politics or different kind of uh, theory of, of conflict for that matter. Uh, but I, uh, I will leave it at that. I suppose the only thing that I can really respond to is the issue about um, forgiving and forgetting and memory and breath. Um, and I think rightfully, as you say, you grew up during apartheid. And what is the big difference between the two memoirs for me is that William Pick was not really the memoir was a way for him to to not forget, to to continue to put on the table what happened to him, whereas Maria Padima walked away, and many of the people in her generation are choosing to... There's, there's nothing to forgive. They're choosing to, to walk away to, in a sense, possibly forget. I mean, these are two very different people who grew up under very different circumstances. And the memoirs are, even though they're about medical education, they are about different aspects of medical education. With regard to the question of, of uh, the split individual, I think um, Ashil might be right. But in, in Buenos Aires, it is a Cartesian thing. In Buenos Aires, we all thought we were French Cartesian people until we, we moved away from there and we realized we were something else. And um, that's why I keep going back to feel like that for a brief period. But uh, my, my way of addressing that, that Cartesian legacy, um, I think it was through the question of trying to move from immunity to community, to uh, something more akin to the multiplicity and relationality that that Ashil was was referring to, perhaps as he said, uh, not uh, being but becoming, constant uh, becoming in 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 relation. Um, the question of return uh, it's interesting for me because uh, I was obsessed um, throughout that experience and also the convalescence period, uh, 
with the question of return, and then I, I, I wrote this memoir, uh, and return is all over this text. And I think, uh, in retrospect, what I found painfully is that uh, return is impossible, uh, that one can never return. The, the image and the, the strive for returning was always there, not only um, returning to a healthy state, but also because uh, remission precisely means living under the constant possibility of the return of the disease, or at least that's the way it's, uh, it's portrayed by science. Res this, uh, disease can return at any time, um, relapse. And, uh, but perhaps that should also be uh, defined in different ways, in the same sense that uh, we shouldn't work along the metaphoricity of war and occupation and survival and defenses and so on, also return. And I was so obsessed that, as I mentioned briefly, but it's developed in the memoir, I returned to Buenos Aires, I rented a place in my, the neighborhood of my childhood, I kept, and, and I could go on and on and on. What I get out of all that experience is the, this is a whole way of trying to deal with incredible senses of loss. Uh, and, and, the pos and the impossibility of return to that previous, all those previous stages. Uh, but the experience of illness just accentuates the, the normality the, of, of loss um, in general. Um, I could say a lot, but I want on, on, on forgiving and, and, and forgetting because Argentina went through this uh, period and now the, recently the the trials have been reopened and there's constantly new uh, politics of memory and new um, juridical regimes that are still persecuting and punishing the perpetrators of atrocities. And lately, um, the, the South African case is being brought up more and more in, in the Argentinian discussion as we should go in that direction. There was uh, forgiving and, and, and so on. Uh, I'm against that kind of analogy and the, the very, very different um, historical and political uh, context. But I could close with this. The question of being forgiving and, and being hospitable. And I wrote about the hospital and hospitality, but what was most uh, maddening for me was this um, nature of the autoimmune illness in which the self is attacking itself or the body is generating what is uh, killing it. Uh, and how could one not fight against that because that is redoubling the, the fight to the death, but how can one be hospitable and forgiving to that uh, illness or tumor or deathly threat, which is uh, the subject itself or, or the body itself? Uh, it's a good metaphor for social processes of democratic transition and transitional justice and, and so on. In all of these questions, an echo of the problem of sociopathography that's so often deployed by a regime. I think the line that you used, Juan, was uh, cancer of leftist guerrillas. Um, so that pathography becomes the method by which to name the group. But what I heard among these papers instead was that the normal is not health. Health is instead something like the pharmacon towards which we must struggle. Health is that which is both the poison and the cure at the same time. And we have to move from this question of the pathographic, which names the body of the, of the socio sociological group, to thinking towards each individual, and that's what I heard in each of these papers, each individual struggling towards a very complicated question of health. Perhaps, as Ian, as you mentioned, that challenges something like those normal biopolitical structures and forces us to think outside the realm of a Cartesian dualism. Um, so thank you so much for these three papers, and I'm going to close the panel there. Thank you. Thanks so much.